This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs The Playbook, and I have a legend here with me. I've worn his clothes for years. I've listened to his commercials, watched his commercials. He is a brand himself, and he's written a new book. I have George Zimmer, the CEO, founder of Men's Warehouse, and he's written a book, I guarantee it, the untold story behind the founder of the Men's Warehouse. Welcome to The Playbook, George. Thank you, David. It is a pleasure, and that was very kind. You're very true, by the way. Very true. And I got to start because, you know, I grew up with a mom and, and your family may be like this as well, but my mom believed in doctor, lawyer, or failure. And being an entrepreneur was not in my uh, family lineage. Uh, but yet, you know, you have a family lineage in your uh, industry. And I was wondering what impact your mother or father had on your career decisions as this is a big issue for a lot of entrepreneurs. Well, uh, you're right. Uh, I did come from an entrepreneurial background rather than the doctor or lawyer or what, what <laughs> they uh, matriculate into. And I'm delighted that uh, I went the way I did. Uh, my father worked for Robert Hall Clothes. You may remember Robert Hall Close when the values go up, 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 and the prices go down, down, down. Robert Hall this season will show you the reason, low overhead. So anyways, that's, I guess, through osmosis, that became the men's warehouse. And, you know, it's interesting because the first time I heard your voice in one of the funny things they say about me is, you know, I have a face for radio, but a beautiful voice uh, as well. You have a very distinctive voice that I think added value uh, to your brand. Uh, it's distinctive in the respect that uh, kind of like EF Hutton, when George Zimmer was speaking, everybody knew it was you and it represented something. What did you want your voice to represent? Because it obviously is iconic in its own nature. Well, I think the best word to describe my voice is gravelly. And, uh, you know, that's not necessarily a compliment, but I think it, it does uh, reflect my voice. And my voice uh, and my beard became part of a, uh, an image, a persona that, uh, you know, you didn't have to be sitting in front of your television to know it was a men's warehouse commercial. Exactly. And, you know, your family tradition and, and experience and relationship with your father, did it carry on while you started your own business? And did he have an influence on you as you started to venture and build your own business? Oh, sure. He lived to be almost 94. So he only passed about four years ago. So he actually spent, after he retired, I would estimate it was about 10 years that he was our senior vice president in charge of real estate. And he and I spoke on the phone two or three times a week. It was quite interesting having your father report to you. That is amazing. And you and I, you know, I, I call myself a Judah Buddha and your book is interesting because it has a lot of energetic and spiritual, uh, you know, type of content. There's a, a lot bigger picture of persistency and resilience and consistency that is, you know, throughout the book, maybe some people won't necessarily gather it, but I can tell, you know, there's a great influence of spirituality in what you believe. How much of an influence does that spirituality have in I guarantee it? Well, uh, I, in the book, I guarantee it. I do tell the story of uh, the book Siddhartha, which I, 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 I very much enjoyed. And at some level, I do believe my own life has a Siddhartha journey quality to it. And uh, I, I'm far from, from over now. I've published this book, but 
uh, my company, Generation Tux, is really uh, booming. Uh, it's an online uh, uh, wedding business. We rent suits and tuxedos to grooms and groomsmen. And although I knew that online was an emerging field uh, six years ago when I started this, uh, because of the pandemic, everything has moved online uh, is, except for essential services. So it really is on fire now. And I, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, you know, it's interesting because you obviously are an expert in traditional media, uh, but everything seems to have changed with the digital aspect of the amplification and perpetuation that occurs with marketing and media. Um, and your journey, like mine, has not been perfect. There's been the rises in the fall. You know, in 2008, I lost over $100 million myself. And, you know, people had many attacks uh, on me, blame, shame, and justification. I lived in a world that felt like of character assassination and liability. Um, did you experience any of those type of attacks in your rise and fall uh, without, you know, taking it personally? How did you deal with this new aspect of these character assassinations and, and brand assassination? Well, uh, of course. I mean, uh, nobody can spend 40 years as I did without uh, having many downs. Uh, fortunately, I, I, I think I'm going out on an up now. And so uh, I really, you know, took a long time to write the book because I didn't want it to have any bitterness. And I, I think I accomplished that. Um, you know, <clears throat> I think what's fascinating about life is much like Siddhartha, that we're all on this journey where we, we suffer uh, trauma, and disappointment, but it's then offset by victory, uh, achievement, and success. So I really think that what I've learned, and I'm older than you, is not to judge prematurely another life, another business idea, or another political philosophy until you, you see uh, what really takes a lifetime to understand. Uh, most judgments we make along the way are, uh, are, I think, premature. A good example is that I remember my entire life, over 50 years, I've been proud of the fact that I'm, I'm a rebel and I opposed Vietnam and I opposed the war on drugs. But when I look back on it now, what I realize is that I would have been better served and the world would have been better served if along the way I had paid more attention to listening to other people, even when I disagreed to try to effect uh, more positive outcomes in the world than, quite frankly, what I've been part of, which is not much positive change in the world. So, yeah, and you're quite an activist and, and a leader uh, in liberal po politics of understanding, appreciating, you know, our similarities, but also appreciating our differences. And I think that we get stigmatized uh, if we have liberal views as some how, you know, being something that we're not and, and things do evolve. And you've been blessed with these 40 years of a journey. I'm, I'm really curious, how does your perspective as well um, change about success? You know, when you first started, you know, what did success mean to you in the middle of your career, a couple decades in, what did it mean to you? And how has that changed today? What does success mean to you? Well, you know, when you're younger, you're very much a materialist. And so success is very connected, connected to money 
and assets. But as you get older, now it, it helps when you get fired from the company you founded. That does create some uh, perspective. But what you realize is that money and assets, although they're, they're helpful, as I wrote in the book, uh, you, you can't get a, along very well without any money. But I stopped paying myself when Men's Warehouse went public in 1992. So I made the decision back then that I wasn't going to measure my definition of success by the size of my bank account or the size of the home that I live in. Uh, I live in a middle-class neighborhood in Oakland. And although I'm uh, wealthy, I'm not as wealthy as I could be if I had focused on that. And you had a great hand in Proposition 215. Uh, I was hoping you could give us a little bit of background about that and what it is and, and how you've helped it. Well, that's the uh, medical marijuana initiative in California that passed in 1996, which began the uh, uh, uh now in California, we have full legalization. Uh, I think about half the country has that and a quarter of the country has medical marijuana and a quarter of the country uh, is, is still in the stone age on, on this rather uh, uh, ra relatively benign substance. It's not entirely benign but relative to alcohol or cigarettes. Or opiates. Or, <laughs> Prescribed yeah, opiates. Much more. Time. Well, I, I, I'm laughing because, you know, as running the most notable sports agency in the world from my friend Lee Steinberg, who is from that area, Berkeley undergrad, Berkeley lawyer, who for years we've been talking about how the positive aspects of uh, marijuana, CBD, uh, outweigh any of the benign side uh, effects that may occur, but even more, you know, I laugh now at the age that I am that, uh, you know, basically marijuana and gambling support all sports. Uh, you know, the financing that comes from what was taboo a decade ago now is the main source of revenue uh, for my greatest joy in life is, as you may be a Gene Tennis fan or an Oakland A's fan, uh, you know, for me, I could imagine if someone told me someday, you know, drugs and gambling will be the biggest supporter uh, of our, our great pastime, I would have laughed, but there it is. Oh, no, David. Thank you for passing the, <laughs> the 215, so. Go ahead. Hey, uh, that was uh, a labor of love, obviously. And we are having uh, a week from this Friday, a 25th year anniversary gathering in San Francisco uh, to celebrate uh, November 5th, in 1996, when this became law. It, it really is a great story. I don't know if there's time, but I do remember, and I will tell this uh, at the reunion, that five presidents sitting and past gathered together to run a commercial opposing medical marijuana. And as soon as I saw that commercial, I knew we were going to win. I love that. You, what you resist persists and that uh, enlightenment. You're the Jewish Sad Guru, uh, one of uh, my favorite uh, mentors that I have. And uh, you and I share a different perspective in how to create change and social impact. Now, you founded a new company, the CEO of Generation Tux, as you had mentioned. Um, are there certain golden rules that you live by? Uh, that have stuck through the 40 years, the ones that you may have learned from your father early on as you now here in you know the second half of, of your uh, entrepreneurial journey. Are there some golden rules that you know really come uh, to fruition now that you're later on in this new company uh, that really you can pass on to us? You know, nothing that I have really created. I did want to comment, by the way, 
on, uh, you know, Colin Powell recently passed. And he was uh, uh, quoted as having said that optimism is a force multiplier. And I believe that is true, except that Gallipoli and in 2008, when you lost your fortune, optimism is usually a force multiplier, but occasionally it can lead to a disaster. And, and you unfortunately have that personal experience. And it's interesting that that, that is generated by optimism, which normally, as Colin Powell said, is a force multiplier. In terms of uh, uh, how I live my life, the best way I can suggest to other people that they make decisions is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Uh, half the time in a complicated world, you don't know the right thing to do, whether it's in love, in business, in sports. And the best way I've always solved that question is to put myself in, in somebody's shoes and say, well, how, how would I like to be treated in that situation? And in the short run, it doesn't always work. But in the middle and long term, you always feel better about yourself. That's absolutely true. Last question real quickly. Through a longer successful journey with a lot of challenges, setbacks, failures, mistakes, I call them lessons. And you know, I told you about a lesson I learned in 2008 uh, through, I wasn't just an optimist. I'm a toptimist. I'm the top of the optimist. So we're the ones that... Uh, could be seen as being punished uh, during 2008, but I consider it actually as an indicator to propel me. I, I don't believe pain, setbacks, failures, and mistakes are punishment. I think uh, through my own spirituality that I truly believe there is a higher source that's looking out for me. And that optimism allows even losing over $100 million to give me the possibilities and probabilities and perspective of making more but a different way to make sure it's not like you said, to define myself as my bank account, but to see how much help and impact I can give uh, back and through me, not for me, but through me for other people. And that changed my entire life. For you, when all these setbacks and failures and mistakes uh, came about as they always do, what became your perspective what to take from it and how to propel yourself, not punish yourself from these experiences? Well, as you can probably tell, I have a, uh, a fairly good sized ego. Uh, I like to dream and talk. And uh, I, I like to uh, think about uh visions of how the world could be better. And, and I find that uh, that type of either inner dialogue or external dialogue is far more beneficial in terms of how I feel about life than how businesses are going or friendships or how my dogs are behaving. Uh, I, I really uh, have learned to be very happy uh, just thinking about how things are and, and, and will be in the future. Well, George, I just have to tell you, you know, the reason I was so excited to have you on the playbook and I've had Deepak Chopra, Sadhguru, and George Zimmer is up there with both of those mentors for me. Uh, and the reason is, is I started thinking about what impact you had personally on my life. And there's three things that I think you, you did for me is one, you made me look good. Uh, through a young entrepreneur, you always made me look good, just incredible value that I had. Uh, but you also made me feel good uh, because I look good. 
uh, and you know, also feel good by just as a marketer looking up to you is how you built a brand is, you know, myself, a middle-aged white Jewish guy. I'm like, I could build my own brand. If George Zimmer can build his own personal brand, I can do it. And then finally, most importantly, how to do good. So you help me uh, with all three, look good, feel good and do good. That's what George Zimmer has empowered all of us. And I suggest everyone go out, read, I guarantee it. This guy can articulate value to exceed what he's asking for all day long. Learn the untold story behind the founder of Men's Warehouse. Thank you so much. 